everyone, and welcome to another Things We Said Today, our weekly roundtable discussion of the Beatles past, present, and we hope to come. I'm Steve Marinucci, author of the Beatles Examiner column and several other Examiner columns, maybe too many to count on examiner.com. Um, let me first uh, introduce my uh, co host first out in the Pennsylvania area, um, the executive editor, boy, there, that, there's a stately title for you, of Beatles yeah. Magazine, <laughs> Mr. Al Sussman. Hello, Al. Hi, Steve. Hello there, everybody. And then we have, uh, going up the coast in uh, Connecticut, the host of the Beatles radio, weekly Beatles radio show, Every Little Thing, Mr. Ken Michaels. Hello, Ken. Hello, Mr. Steve. Hi, everybody. <laughs> And going further north up in Maine, where it's probably cold, and then, but who knows, is our musicologist, classical music expert, and uh, everything, everything, I, I can't even describe all, all Mr. Cozen's qualities, but uh, Mr. Alan Cozen, hello, Alan. Hello, Steve. Hello, everyone. Our special guest this week is um, somebody that... Um, that uh, I've interviewed several times, and I'm really glad we got her on the show. It's uh, Jude Sutherland Kessler, the author of the John Lennon series of biographies. Uh, I'm not going to – I'm going to resist the hey, Jude, but hello, Jude. Hey, Steve and Al and Alan and Ken. You guys are so very nice to have me on. I respect your work, Steve and Al. You and I have been on radio shows together many times and are good sure. friends, but this is mm-hmm. my first time to visit Ken with you and Alan with you, and you guys are incredibly well-known and respected in the Beatles world, and it is a great honor to be here with all four of you tonight. Thank you so much. Well, thanks, I, Judith. Well, I, thank I, you. I think we're just going to stop the show right there. Yeah, <laughs> that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> and very true, very okay. true. All right. Th- thank you. Thank you very much, Jude. Um, let's start by... For just to give you, give everybody an introduction about the. Let's talk about the John Lennon series of books. There are tell tell us how many there are. The most recent one is She Loves You, right? And and and, and give us a rundown on the series and how that's progressing and when's the next when the next one is coming out. Okay, it's a nine proposed nine volume work. And what I initially set out to do was to write uh, a narrative biography of John's life. And at the time that I started writing it, I didn't realize that a literary genre actually existed. The Greeks used it. Thucydides wrote the history of the Peloponnesian War and what is called a narrative history. And that is when you tell something accurately with documentation and you don't deviate from the truth, but you tell it as a story. When I first wrote Should Have Been There, I had only heard of historical fiction. And Steve, you said to me, you know, this really isn't historical fiction. If I were you, I would call this an augmented biography. I I think I said enhanced biography. Enhanced biography. Same 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 thing. That's right. And so then I found out about the fact that there actually was a genre. I was just asked to write uh, an article for Ken Womack's new book that's coming out. And it, interestingly enough, is entitled Things We Said Today. (laughs) (laughs) And it's going to be about the different formats and genres in which the Beatles are examined. And my article is in there on the historical narrative. But the book's tell the story of different segments of John's life. First one should have been there as 1940 to December of 61 when Brian offers them that loose managerial agreement. Second book, Shivering Inside, is from December of 61 up to the birth of Julian in April of 63. That's the rise to British fame. And then the next book, She Loves You, is 63 through the 22nd of February, 64, when the Beatles return from America to start working on A Hard Day's Night. And the book I'm doing right now is Should Have Known Better. That starts with A Hard Day's Night in March of 1964 and will go up through the end of 1965. Nine books all total, all written as if you're reading a story but the last book had 4,000 footnotes in it. So you are getting exactly what was said, what they did. And the only 
supposition or enhancement is if I have someone walk to the window or clear your throat or whatever, that I wasn't there to see. But everything else, we stick as closely to what actually happened as humanly possible. And you have, I mean, when you started out, I know there's been criticism of, of your work in the past, and but you've gotten some al- some really big allies. Um, yeah. Tell me, just name a couple of people. Uh, I'm thinking of one person, and if you, you don't say who, that person's name, I will mention it. But, I mean, there you've gotten some, some big allies now. Well, I didn't really realize. I did not know, first of all, that the genre of fanfic even existed, or I would have. I My uh, master's degree is in historical research. I have two mm-hmm. degrees, one in history and one in English. And so my job always was to do extensive research and should have been there. All I did was put the chapters and the pages where you could find the information. Had I known that fanfic existed, I would have started from the very beginning footnoting every sentence so that you knew where I found all my information. But I didn't know to do that. I do it now. Mm-hmm. But my work has really been supported, and I, and I could not have done it without the help of Bill Harry. For example, I was talking with Bill Harry extensively over the last two weeks about the Foils Literary Luncheon, trying to set that straight. I've worked with Larry Kane. I've worked with Richard Langham. I've worked with all of the people who've been gracious at EMI to let me use the tape so that I can have the conversation from in studio. John's sister, Julia Baird, has worked with me hand in hand. She's been so nice to help me. May Pang has been very gracious to work with me. And ne- the next book will be her era. So we'll be, she'll be coming into play in the next book. She said, I'll work with you hand in hand. All the people in Liverpool from Patty Delaney, the doorman at the Cavern Club, to Alan Williams, to Helen Anderson, who was John's best friend in college. I could not have done this without hundreds of people. Bob Wooler, who sat down with me and they would take their chapters, read them and say, well, in the example of Bill Harry, you have me in the wrong room of you crack. You need to move me into the back room, put me under the painting of Lord Nelson, and you have me drinking ale. I only drank bitter. So that's the kind of detail we're dealing with. (laughs) Okay. Okay. And one one more thing I I want to ask is that, well, I was going to mention Lewison, actually. You and Mark Mark Lewison has – has supported you, correct? Very much so. I was so, you know, you have those, as John would say, red lettuce moments in your life. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. when he and I both were speakers at the uh, Beatles International Symposium at Penn State Altoona, he said from the podium, no one does the kind of research I do besides Jude. And I mean, you know, I wanted to capture that moment. I wanted to (laughs) photograph it, freeze it in time. He's been... (laughs) So nice to me and so helpful. And he said, you're a little bit obsessive, but other than that, it's wonderful. <laughs> Let me ask one more quick question, and then I'm going to hand, hand it off. Uh, yesterday, the um, auction house in England, um, I'm trying to remember the name of it now, Trax announced they were selling John's earliest yes. letter. And I want, and somebody, a, a couple of people made comments on Facebook to me because I wrote it up this morning. They said, you know, John should, or somebody, somebody in the family should have that. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think that now the family realizes with all the conversations that I've had with John's uncle Charlie and with Julia and with so many of the families, they realize now that it's big business mm-hmm. and they do have all of their memories and it's in their hearts. I don't think they expect people to donate and to give that to the family. I do think it would be a lovely gesture, but they, they still have John. He's living in them the way he's living in me and okay. they, they still remember. Okay. Al? Well, springing off of what, uh, what Steve was, was just saying, I think people who are not familiar with this particular you know, as you call it, narrative biography, uh, I think probably the chief criticism that there's been have been people who are saying, well, there's dialogue in there that uh, she never could have uh, could have uh, found out uh, that, you know, that sort of thing. Um, how do you answer those types of charges? And maybe you can explain the kind of like the mechanics of, as they call it, narrative biography. Sure, I'd be glad to. That is a tough and great question. 
in should have been there, of course, it was extremely difficult. Uh, I may have research telling me that John and Mimi were in the kitchen. I even know in one of the stories that she was frying up steak and uh, steak and eggs in a skillet for John for supper when the phone rang. And it was Corey Bank calling to tell her that John was going to be expelled once again if he didn't change his ways and going through all the things he'd been doing wrong. But what Mimi exactly said to John in that kitchen when she hung up the telephone and what he exactly said to her, no one knows. We're not privy to that information. So when he was very young, yes, I tell you at the ends of those chapters, all conversation is conjecture. I may know the date, the time, the incident, the place, but if there's any conversation, that was conjecture. But after 1961, everything that the Beatles said and did and wore and ate was documented. And I go to great lengths to try to find out the answers. For example, on the day that uh, George Martin takes them to the Alpino for lunch when they are recording in EMI in September, I know that they're going to the Alpino for lunch, but I don't know how they're going to get there. Does he drive them there? What car does he have? What does the car look like? What color is it? What did they eat for lunch? I know what they're talking about over lunch. It's well documented. The fact that they don't want to record how do you do it, and they want to record their own song. I have quotes from them about what was said. It's in the anthology. It's in many other sources. But what were they eating while they were doing this? So I wrote to Nigel and asked him if he would ask George, and George answered me and said, that's the oddest set of questions I've ever been asked. But when you're writing a chapter with that kind of detail, you can't make it up. Or as John would say in his fake scouse, I don't make it up. I have to get the information. And that's why I've done so many interviews. And I have been so grateful to the people who have shared tapes with me so that I can use the dialogue. In Shivering Inside and in She Loves You, 90% of the dialogue is what I actually find. For example, I've just written the chapter on the Foyles Literary Luncheon. Every word that Cynthia speaks and every word that John speaks is quoted in either Cynthia's book, John, or in her book, A Twist of Linen, or in Tony Barrow's book, John, Paul, George, Ringo, and Me, and I combine those, and what I do when I write a chapter is I research every single possible source on that topic, sometimes 40 to 50 sources. I type out about 70 pages of notes, I set them beside me, and I go methodically through creating the event and checking off each fact as I use it and then footnoting it as I turn it into the chapter. It takes up several months to create each chapter, and it's a very slow and tedious process, but that ensures that you're getting the actual story. Absolutely. Now, for, in- for instance, uh, the, uh, the Foils Literary Luncheon. Uh, most people, I, I would say the... And it's generally only sort of first generation fans who even remember this at all is that's the the luncheon in April of 64 at which uh, John was given an award, got up, said, thank you, you've got a lucky face, sat back down. That's basically all that the, you know, that most people know about it. Give us an idea of the, of the kind of things that you've been able to uncover about that particular event. Okay, I hope you guys are as excited about this as I am. I mean, yeah, I'm just, I, and if you're not, you know, big John Lennon people, maybe you're not, but I am thrilled. It's like a big moment in my life. I knew, and you guys know, because you know Brian Epstein's very scrupulous work ethic so well. Sure. And you know the kind of family that Brian was raised in. This is a family who goes to the Adelphi for Sunday lunch every Sunday. Very well-to-do, very cultured. Queenie Epstein's ethics and the morals that she imported to her son were beyond question. So I knew from day one that Brian had to know that, John was expected to make an acceptance speech at the Foyles Literary Luncheon. The fact that people say he had no idea he was supposed to make the speech is preposterous. But I couldn't find proof. But I knew that Brian would know. He's a RADA trained theater person. He is a cultured person. He knows that postprandial speeches are expected, especially when you win an award. 
So I started digging and digging and digging. And I first found a British biographer named Jacqueline Edmondson, who wrote a book called John Lennon Biography. And she states very clearly in the book that John did know that he had been told about the speech prior to the luncheon, but he didn't expect to give it. Because he had asked Brian to contact the hotel and say that he would give the speech. And I was elated because I knew that had to be the fact. Philip Norman follows up with that. And he says that, and this I'm quoting from him, he said, John had initially expressed express willingness to make the traditional speech. But as the day approached, he became increasingly uneasy about it, even admitting to an interviewer, I durant and his thickest faux naif scouts. Well, that radio interview that he does prior to the falls to the Foils luncheon is followed up with a radio interview immediately after the luncheon, minutes after the luncheon, in which the interview says to John, a lot of the literary toffs here today, John, were disappointed that you didn't say a few words. Why didn't you speak? And instead of saying, well, no one told me, I was unprepared, it took me by surprise, John simply answers, because I daren't, you know, I'd be scared stiff. So the fact of the matter is he knew, Cynthia says he didn't know in both of her books. She's taking the company line. She's covering for him because she adores him. But he knew he was supposed to give the speech. And as the day got closer, he was terrified. And in a cellar full of noise, Brian defends him and says John was being a beetle in this. He was not tackling something that he knew he couldn't do well. And so he very wisely gave the speech to me. So why is John put in this horrible predicament? If you watch him, you can actually go to YouTube and you can watch him give the speech. Just type in John Lennon Foyle's Literary Luncheon. You'll mm-hmm. see John try to struggle to his feet. You'll see Sir Osbert Lancaster trying to help him. You will see him not be able to rise. He bends at the waist. He keeps his head below the microphone. He's humiliated, and he very blurtingly says, thank you very much, God bless you, making the sign of the cross twice. And then as he falls into his chair, he turns to the man on his left and says this very telling line, you've got a lucky face. Well, Mm -hmm. if you know Liverpool Scouse, you've got a lucky face is what a street beggar says to someone who gives them something that they don't feel they deserve. If you give them more money than you should have, or if you give them a gift, or if you give them a lot of money, they say to you, ah, you got a lucky face, meaning you're giving me something I don't deserve. And that's what John's saying to this man on his left. And Mm -hmm. so why did Brian let him go through that humiliation? Why did he let John get up and The only thing that I can figure out, and now you're into supposition land, but let me, but hear me out and see what you think. And I'll, you guys chime in. Mm -hmm. You know, John and Cynthia had gone out the night before to the ad lib. They'd gone out with a bunch of their friends from Liverpool and they were drinking. John gets up the next morning. He decides not to wear glasses because his, he, he knows he's going to be photographed. Cynthia doesn't wear hers either. He doesn't put in his contact lenses because his eyes are <laughs> extremely dry. Uh-huh. He goes into that room, and he even says in several quotes that the room was a watercolor to him. He had no idea what he's seeing. He goes to the head table, and he's sitting there, very unsure of himself in this situation, and he expects Brian to come up and say, okay, John, just introduce me, and I'll give the speech. Brian doesn't come. Brian is seated next to Christina Foyle. She's on his left, and he is talking with her and feels that it would be in poor taste for him to get up, excuse himself from Miss Foyle, go up to the dais and say to John, just so you know, I'm here. He doesn't know John can't see him. When Brian never materializes, John thinks he's stuck. He thinks he has to give the speech, and that's what he does. Immediately after, Brian makes his way up to the dais, speaks to Sir Osbert Lancaster, asks to accept the award on John's behalf, and he gives a lovely acceptance speech in which he separates himself and says, I had nothing to do with this book. This was all John. He did it despite the pressures that were put upon him. He is a beetle who separated himself from beetleism, as he puts it, and I commend him. I am very proud of him today, and he makes it all right for John. But I think that's why John was forced into giving the speech. He knew he had to give it, couldn't give it, asked Brian to give it, 
Brian telephoned the hotel and told them that he was giving it. No one told the Foils people. No one told Sir Osbert Lancaster. He announces John. John stuck. He does the best he can. He gives this very telling line about you've got a lucky face. You know, I don't really feel like I even deserve this. He collapses, and then Brian comes in and does what he was supposed to do in the first place. If John had known Brian was there, he could have said, and now my manager will accept it for me. But he has no idea he's there, and so there you have it. What do you think? <laughs> Sounds like John and yeah. Brian should have coordinated this together beforehand. Yeah. Did John and Brian <laughs> not go to the lunch together? No, John and Cynthia wake up. And the interesting thing, Ken, is that every book that you're going to look at is going to tell you that John was that morning uh, recording the episode in the field in which they were running and playing in the field when they've escaped the building and they've run oh, down. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. okay, John, according to Cynthia, they got in at 5 a.m. They partied until 4. Then they went out to get a meat pie. And they got home at 5 o'clock, fell into bed. They were beyond intoxicated. And they wake up at 10 o'clock, only having a half hour to dress before the chauffeur is coming. Bill Corbett's going to pick them up and take them to the luncheon. Mm -hmm. So if that is the case, and if she is correct in both of her books when she says that, Brian was not with them. It was John and Cynthia and Bill Corbett driving them. And so they have no clue that that Brian's there. Wow. Mm -hmm. But still, I mean, the day before, they could have talked to each other and said, this is how we're going to handle this. Right. You know? Right. They should have. They should have. And yeah. I guess when John called up and said, I'm not going to give the speech, you're going to have to give it for me, it was probably more, and again, this is just conjecture here, it was probably more of, oh, John, you've had forever to make up your mind, and now you're telling me this, and I'm sure that Brian spent more time saying that than how are we going to pull this off. He, he ends up saying, I'm going to give the speech, writes the speech, rehearses the speech, and is ready, but somehow the wires cross, and John doesn't call on him, and then we have the You've Got a Lucky Face episode. Mm-hmm. Mm. Mm. Okay. Uh, Ken? Well. Well, I was just curious since you're mentioning this award. It's often been said the Beatles took their art seriously, but they didn't take themselves seriously. How seriously do you think John took his poetry in those in those two books that he wrote? In his own right and a Spaniard in the works. Now, I know I, that he had this love for a play on words and he was so great at it. Was he very proud of that stuff, or did he just kind of, you know, toss it aside, this was something he did in his spare time, or did he really take it all seriously as an art? Well, Ken, as you know, John always pretends not to take anything seriously because that's his protection. That's his barrier. If he tells you that it's it's just funny stuff and it's just something to be laughed at, which he says over and over, it's not meant to mean anything. It's just funny. It's just something that people can snicker at then you're not going to judge him the same way that you would if he said, yes, it's serious. And John would never say, yes, it's serious anyway. He would always say, it doesn't mean anything. I don't care about it. Because that is the barrier that he puts up to keep you from knowing that he actually does get hurt. You know, oh, I, if something bad happens to him, oh, it didn't mean anything to me. If he is abandoned, if he's lost, if he's criticized, none of it meant anything to him. But it all means more to him than it means to anyone else. And let me tell you why I think that. When the Beatles all decide as early as that first tour of Scotland that they're going to take pseudonyms and Paul's going to be Paul Ramon and George Carl Harrison, it's only John who won't take a pseudonym. Stu is going to be Stu de style. They all have names, not John. Because for John, doing what he did, becoming that boy at the toppermost of the poppermost, achieving that success he always had to achieve is what validates him, is what makes him feel that it's okay that his mother, for complicated reasons, left him behind when she had two other beautiful little girls who lived with her. And he visits them. He knows that she kept two children, but not him. It's what makes Mm -hmm. him feel loved when he thinks about Mimi throwing his artwork away. And he says, you're going to regret that you did that. Someday you'll be sorry. What validates him is the toppermost of the toppermost. It is his artwork. It is his poetry. And he says, the Beatles have done everything together except for this. This is mine and mine alone. That's in the anthology. And I think he took it extremely seriously. He puts in that 
supposedly nonsensical poetry and prose, the angst that is his life, the sorrow that is his life, it's in there. It's, it's in between every line of both of those books. The anger, the frustration at the way his life has turned out. And he may call it laughable. He called his songs laughable. He, he said, oh, well, that was a throwaway, and, and that was no good, and that was embarrassing. But really, John always strived to do the very best he could because that told his story, and that's what made people – i.e. Mimi, i.e. Julia, sorry that they treated him the way he did. So you think when John said that certain songs were throwaways, he wasn't being, you know, very critical of himself, which a lot of artists are. You know, you could just say that John was being super critical of his work, and plenty of people are that way. Yeah. So that's more a defense, you're saying? Sometimes. Sometimes he really means it when he tells you that he doesn't like a song. But let's take one that he criticizes that I think – was too painful for him to say meant a lot. I mean, some of the songs, I agree, he'll say, oh, that was just a formula song, or that was just something that we threw together at the last minute. Right. From me to you, written from a headline in a paper, a throwaway song. Yeah, it was just something we did quickly to fill up time on a record. Great record, wonderful record, but not something that's deep. But let's take Girl, written when his marriage is starting to break up, when he is fighting with Cynthia, written when he's starting to feel like like things are falling apart. It's Only Love, written in that same time frame. He yeah. said he hated It's Only Love. But when he says, is it right that you and I should fight every night? That isn't funny. That's a very serious line written to Cynthia. Just the sight of you makes nighttime bright. He is He's still very much in love with her, but things are falling apart. He disses that song. He downplays that song, but really it was a song written from the heart. So I think sometimes when John says, oh, that was just, that was, that meant nothing. Yes, it was a formula song, but very many times he uses it as a cover up for the fact that he was hurting when he wrote that song. And he said that being married was like walking around with only, you know, what, underwear and your socks on. And this (laughs) is what it's like to him when you hear him talking about the failures of his marriage. It's embarrassing. Yeah, sometimes (laughs) artists. When they're struggling in their personal life, they take it out on the music. And, you know, they rate that music from that time as though they don't think as highly of it, only because of what they're going through with their personal problems. So that could just very well be the case right there. Right. It's embarrassing. It's humiliating. And he doesn't want you to know that much about him because, after all, in his heart of hearts, he's the leather-wearing John Lennon, the Hamburg John, the rocker John, And for you to see him as soft and emotional is pretty humiliating. All right. I just have one really important, really important question to ask you, because very often here on this show and through all the the shows I've done on the Beatles, I talk about what a complex person John Lennon was. Mm. And he was very hard to figure out. He changed his opinions all the time on certain subjects. And it's hard to, to know who the real John Lennon was. You know, this was someone who was very complex had a lot of ambivalence about a lot of different subjects. Isn't it difficult at times for you to really thoroughly examine his personality and explain it well when he's that complicated? He is so fascinating because he is so complicated. And John would wake up every morning in a different mood. You would never know whether you were going to get John who was saying, I don't care what people think about me when I'm gone or John, who was saying that you are never forgotten until the last person who remembers you dies. Those are two completely different philosophies. A John who said he was apolitical and a John who was very political. A John who said that women should be obscene and not heard. And then John who stands and sings, woman is the nigger of the world, was standing up for women's rights. You never knew which John you were going to get. But consistently, John is the little child. And the great romantic poet William William Wordsworth said, the child is father of the man. And that little boy who used to sing himself to sleep because Mimi wouldn't and George wasn't allowed to and Julia wasn't there, that fearful, hurt, angry, sad little boy 
is always John. And that John lurks at the core of every pretense and every face that he puts on. So that that person is always there. That's why, to me, people say, oh, well, I really loved Shivering Inside because I like the chapter about the Capitol recording session. Or I love She Loves You. I like them coming to America. But if you don't read Should Have Been There and get to know that little boy, then you don't understand anything else about John Lennon. He is that child. Mm. Okay. Very well put there. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Jude. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Ken. Um, Alan? Yeah, I, I I was very interested in what you said about the uh, you know his his comments about his songs and other things that he is dismissive of, but actually feels very close to because uh, in in a certain way it's kind of clear that that that's the case. I mean, he was critical critical enough and self critical enough that if he really thought it was junk, he wouldn't have put it out. Right. You know. And also there was a – I can't remember which interview. It may have been the Rolling Stone interview in 1970, but it kind of comes out where uh, you know he's, he's angry about things that Mick Jagger is saying about the Beatles. And he's saying, you know, it's one thing for me to say it, but don't you say that, you know. Mm-hmm. And it's sort of interesting because it, 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 it lets you see through that um, that sort of – critical thing that he does about his own stuff when he's actually actually pretty proud of it yeah. that was that was my sense anyways i was sort of i was sort of glad to hear that analysis i'm curious about also uh you know a little more about that um foil's literary luncheon um but i'm not sure i'm really not sure what else to ask i mean i've, I've never heard that much detail about it, and uh, so I'm sort of looking forward to to reading your your account of it. Yeah, uh, is there is there anything else in 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 terms of the the run up to it? Do you have any alternate theories? Because because when you when you explained it to us, you had said you know okay, this is the best I could piece together. What do you think? Do you have an alternate uh, candidate for what might have happened? You know, I, I really don't, and I cannot think of any other reason that John would not say, my manager's going to accept this for me. He had to have been backed into a corner. And the only way that I can reason that he would have been backed into the corner, because, you know, Alan, if he could see Brian sitting at the table, and you must assume that Christina Foyle's table was very close to the dais. I mean, she's the one who right. established this luncheon, so he, he has to be very close to John. But the fact that, that he doesn't see him and he doesn't know that he's there has to be his explanation for simply just, why didn't he just turn it over to Brian? And right. It has to be that he couldn't see him and, and then wasn't sure. And I can understand because with A Hard Day's Night going on and having such an extensive stable of busy people, I was reading in Tony Barrow's book today, he was talking about Brian, and he said, and this is a quote from him, Brian worked harder and longer than was necessary, often on tasks which could have been delegated. He was mm. my manager. So yeah. John's wondering, you know, was Brian called away? Am I being forced into this? Because surely if he's here, he would have come up. And so Mm -hmm. he does the best he can. But, you know, for years it was just this myth that he didn't know about it. This happened to him, how terrible it was. and, Mm -hmm. and, And he did know. But he took the better, higher road in saying, I am not capable of doing this, and I don't want to do a bad job, so Brian, you're going to have to do it. And the speech that Brian delivers, part of which is in Cellar Full of Noise, is a beautiful speech. And it in the newspapers the next day, they actually wrote about Brian's speech and said what a lovely job he did accepting for John. But it's too bad that John was put in that position <coughs> to begin with. Yeah, you know, I mean, it seems obviously if he arranged with Brian in advance, then he, for some reason, under even optimal conditions, felt that he couldn't give the speech. But yet, given given John's wit, especially at the spur of the moment, you would think that if he were sober or and not hung over, he could actually have made something about that because he could stand there and 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 improvise with the best of them. So it's it's kind of surprising in a way. It, I always thought it had more to do with um sort of his his state at the moment 
than with um, any sort of big fear that he was speaking in front of literary people, you know. But he turned it down now two days before. You know, he calls Brian and says, I can't do it. And he does that interview yeah. two days before in which he says, I don't. I'd be yeah. scared. Yeah. You know, John is not in his wheelhouse. He's not on stage singing. He is not doing what he knows that he does well. He is being asked to speak in front of a group of people. And, and stage fright is the number one fear of most people. Uh, it really, it is the number one fear more than pit bulls chasing them down when they're <laughs> rocking. <laughs> <laughs> and so mm. for him to think about standing up and wearing a – he's he's given the option to wear a suit or a tuxedo, and he, he opts for the suit. But he's next to Sir Osbert Lancaster, who is wearing a, a tuxedo and a white bow tie and the whole works. He's out of his element, and he's constantly being reminded by the press that he's from Liverpool, a second-rate part of England. I was part oh. of the Daughters of the British Empire for years in Kansas City, and when I moved to Pennsylvania, I joined the Daughters of the British Empire up there, and I had to talk about the city that meant the most to me. And so they people had been friendly to me that first night. They were chatting with me, and we were getting along just fine. And so I stood up and said, well, my real home is Liverpool. I've been there seven times. I have so many friends over there, and it means the world to me. And they were like, Liverpool? And nobody was nice to me again. I ended up dropping out. <laughs> and, wow. and they were so rude. And so, you know, he's thinking, I'm this guy from Liverpool that's standing up in front of the people that, that were there that day, the guest list was impressive. I mean, he knew some of the people there who had been part of his tours and and Helen Shapiro was there, Wilfred Bramble was there, but many of them were famous cartoonists and artists and writers and he's thinking I just can't do this and do this well. Mm-hmm. So what does John do when he can't do something well? He doesn't do it. Mhm. He's smart enough to know I'm not going to put myself in a position of failure. He never puts himself in a position of failure. He always plays from his strength. So he turns it over to Brian, and Brian did do a fantastic job. Mm-hmm. Going back to your earlier comments about your research and uh, how you put these things together, um, you know, when, whenever, as you know, whenever you research something that an awful lot has been written about by a great number of people, even a great number of people who were all there, you run into contradictions. It just happens. You get two people in a room and they tell a different story. How do you handicap these things when you have to make a choice of of what seems plausible to you? What I do at the end of every chapter is I have a section called Notes. And it's become more and more extensive. It it first was just a, a paragraph or two, and then it was like a half a page. Now it's several pages. And I will take what each person says. Let's go back to Paul's 21st birthday. I will tell you what everyone said about what the scenery looked like, what Paul called her. It was Auntie Jen with a J or Jen with a G or Jenny. Or I'll go through every detail. Then what people said about John's confrontation with Bob Wooler. And we will trace it as the story progresses through the years. What the earliest biographers said, we'll go back to Hunter Davies, and we'll go all the way through and trace each report from each Beatles scholar and what they said. And then we try to get to the nugget of the truth. What did Bob Wooler report? What did Brian report? What did Tony Barrow have to deal with in the press? We try to narrow it down and find out what is the nugget of the truth after all of these contradicting reports have been given. When it's extremely difficult for me is when one person gives two different accounts. In A Twist of Linen, Cynthia says that when John asked her to dance at the end of term bash at Liverpool College of Art, the very first time they ever danced together, that they danced to, quote unquote, a slow, smoochy song. And several times she refers to that being the teddy bears to know him is to love him. So when he says to her in her ear at that point in that first book, fancy going out with me then, and she stammers something about being engaged to someone else, it makes really no sense. Why would she do that other than the fact that she's smitten with him and doesn't know what she's saying? 
But in her second book, her 2005 book, John, she says that it was a Chuck Berry rocker that they were dancing to and that John called that out across the expanse. They're dancing apart, and he shouts, you fancy going out with me then? And she's embarrassed, and that's why she says, well, I'm engaged to someone else. So how do I handle that when I get ready to write that account? Which song are they dancing to? Are they close together? Are they far apart? I don't know what to do. And so the what I did in that instance was said, Cynthia's mind was reeling. She couldn't even tell you whether they were dancing to a slow, smoochy song or a Chuck Berry rocker. Mm-hmm. You know, what okay. else? What else can you do? You know, you're stuck. Mm -hmm. The hardest one for me was writing that chapter about Brian and John and the last night on their long Spanish holiday. It's called, you know, the trip to Barcelona, but Barcelona was just one of many wonderful places that they visited. A wonderful, wonderful holiday. Mm -hmm. You know that there are 28 different versions of what happened in that room, and no one was in that room except for John and Brian. And John told two different accounts of what happened, and they completely were 180 out. So writing that, it was terrible. And I went out running one day, and as I was running, the whole way to handle it came to me. And I came home and said to my husband, don't talk to me. I've got to go do this after. <laughs> and I was there, firing all over the computer, little drops falling on, and finished it. But if you go back and read She Loves You and see the way I finished it, You'll see, I could not, you can't say that one version is true and another version is not true because no one was there and no one told. So it's hard to handle. Your question is so, it is the story of my life. How am I going to handle these different versions of the same event? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And especially when it's John, when it's the, the main character himself uh, that you're writing about and has different versions, that's very frustrating. Very frustrating. Very yeah. frustrating. Right. Yeah. Okay. Back to Steve. Yes, back to me. Thanks, Alan. Um, Jude, I recently did a, an article on how I won the war. Um, and I was really. I mean, that movie really confounded me a lot. I mean, it almost had me wondering what John was doing in there. I mean, I know what he was doing in there. He was kind of stepping away from everything and, and, you know, doing something on his own. What do you think the significance of that movie is, uh, both in terms of of his role and in terms of what it meant to his his Beatle career? Well, you know, there are many times in John's life in which he's lost his way, and he uses an artistic vehicle to find himself back to John again. Mm -hmm. And the conflicts that were going on at that time were absolutely over the top. I mean, think of how difficult it is to lose one friend, much less your family, the people who have become your family, your best friends. And the pressures that were on with, with Apple, the complete disillusion of everything that they had done for years and then the pressure to go out on your own. You're not a Beatle. You need to go out. You need to be John. You're no longer a Beatle. You're John. And he's, I think, Steve, exactly what you said. I think you nailed it. I think he is finding his way. He is rediscovering John Lennon and who John Lennon is going to be from 1970 to 1980 and to me, that John Lennon is is the great artist. I'm a huge Beatles fan, but I am a tremendous John Lennon fan, and I love his works in the 70s, in all through the 1970s. But he had to find that person. He had to to slough off the Beatle and become John, and I think that's what he's doing. Mm-hmm. Somebody somebody wrote, and I, I saw it recently, and I can't remember if it was you or somebody else. That when Cynthia saw the the scene at the end where he gets shot, that she screamed and she she just really went over the top. Was that you or is that somebody else? Oh, no, that wasn't me. Do you, and do you know is that reaction correct? Do you know that if Cynthia was really, I mean, was she there to see that and did did she uh, really have a an incredible reaction over that? Do you know? No, I honestly don't know, and and you guys may know more about that than I do. And the reason is that the way I work this is I know generally a good bit about John, but I only am an expert on John up to the moment that I've researched. Mm -hmm. So 
As of our speaking point, I only know John up to the end of the Foils Literary Luncheon. Ah, okay. <laughs> what, what I do is when I get started, I have about, um, look behind me, about 300 some odd Beatles books or more. I start researching in every single thing that I can find. I, I go through every index trying to find that incident. And then I research it. I take notes. I compile it, and then I put it together. I may know what happened at the Foils Luncheon as per myth, legend, and what I've heard all my life, but I don't really know it till I research it. So when I get to that point, I'll make sure I find out for you if you don't already know by then. Mm -hmm. Okay. Ken, your turn. Well, we have to ask you about this upcoming uh, Beatles Symposium yes. that you'll be a part of. Uh, it's actually happening at the new Grammy Museum in Mississippi. So why don't you tell us about that? I tell you what, I have to say right off the bat that I've always really liked Mark Lapidos and really enjoyed going to the Fest for Beatles fans. It's always been a happy time in my life for me. But now I sort of have Mark Lapidos on a pedestal that he'll never come down from because <laughs> I've been the co-chair of this event and it literally is taking hours every single day out of my life and it is such a difficult job uh, I spent two hours today doing tweets on every single person taking part working out the logistics of getting a transportation from everyone that's coming the wonderful people coming to it and making sure that they have entertainment each night we have places to go eat and things like that it's a huge job and he does this on a much grander scale than a literary symposium a Beatles symposium so my hat is off to him. He is he is my hero. But we mm -hmm. are um we're having a two day, a day and a half Beatles symposium at the new Grammy Museum, Mississippi. And I just when I heard that they had a standing exhibit, it's that wonderful exhibit that was put together by Chuck Gunderson and Jeff Augsburger and Mark Navichek mm -hmm. and Russ Lee. Yep. Ladies and gentlemen, the Beatles, when I heard that that was going to be the first exhibit at the new Grammy Museum in Cleveland, Mississippi, I drove over and met with Lucy Janusz, who's the president of the board of directors, and said, we've got to do a Beatles symposium. We, we have to have great speakers and bands and artists and everyone come in for the weekend. And they sort of, you know, poof poof the idea, and I didn't hear from them for six months. And then one day I got a call on my cell phone. And it was the new education and program director, Jane Marie Dawkins. And she said, are you serious about wanting to do a Beatles symposium? And if so, write a proposal. So I wrote my dream symposium. And my dream was to have Frida Kelly let us show good old Frida. Mm -hmm. and, to, and then to have Frida come from Liverpool and do a Q&A. And that happened almost immediately. She said, absolutely, you can show the film and I will come from Liverpool and I will stay for two days and meet everyone and talk with them up close and personal and I'll do a Q&A afterwards. So I was on the road to dreamland. And then I got to really know Ivor Davis very well when we worked together on Beatles at the Ridge last year. And he is the most entertaining, young, vivacious person <laughs> I've ever been around. He <laughs> makes me feel eons old. And he, of course, traveled with the Beatles, the only journalist that was with them the entire time on that North American tour in 64. And so as I got to know him, I thought, oh, I would love to have him come share his memories and come speak and talk about that 64 tour. So I asked him, and then he said yes. And then Dr. Kid O'Toole, who released not one but two books in 2015, I can't even imagine because it takes me years to do one. She did songs we were singing, guided tours through the Beatles' lesser-known tracks, and she also did a great book on Michael Jackson that incorporates Paul's relationship with Michael and that whole thing about the song catalog and so forth and so on. She was my a great pick to have, and she agreed to take part. And so did Dr. Candy Leonard, who wrote a book that I know you all know and respect. Mm -hmm. Sure. Even, yeah. So she said she would come. Anthony Robustelli, Anthony and Bruce Spicer, I just respect to death. I mean, they are the ultimate, the penultimate Beatles music people and especially Bruce from this area being so close to the Grammy Museum. So I invited both Bruce and 
Anthony, and they both agreed to come. Anthony's going to do his Beatles multi-track meltdown, mm-hmm. and he's a musician. I said, Anthony, would you consider doing a jam and playing Beatles music and then reenacting the All You Need Is Love, Hey Jude thing, and letting people come up on stage with their ukuleles and their guitars and their tambourines, and we'll have the first ever Grammy jam. And he said he'd do it. So we have that on the docket. My dear, dear friend, Lena Stagg. I don't know if you guys know Lena. She is. I know know Lena. Oh, very well. What a ray of sunlight. She is going to do our lunch and learn, and she's going to hand make four Beatles Savoy truffles, one in each flavor. And as of this interview, she's still making John's a lemon truffle. I'm trying to make her at least call it a sweet lemon truffle. <laughs> each beetle is going to have a truffle. She's going to teach people how to make the truffles. She's going to give them a take-home box of truffles. And a very talented young musician, Cameron Hicks, from West Memphis, Arkansas, is going to play Savoy Truffle because the Grammy is all about youth and education and bringing the Beatles to the next generation. So he's going to perform at that luncheon. She's going to give the history of the song and and show people the recipe. It's going to be her combination of food and rock and roll because she has those great recipe records books. And then we're going to have three artists who are going to exhibit. Enoch Doyle Jeter is the artist who did those amazing lithographs for She Loves You, Volume 3 in the John Lennon series. I always dreamed of having a chapter in the book that did not have a single word written in it. It was conveyed in art, just as John conveyed his ideas through art. So I approached Doyle Jeter, who runs the longest John Lennon birthday party in America. He started having parties for John before his passing, and he's still carrying on each year with the John Lennon birthday party. And Yoko has recognized this party twice and thanked us for the birthday party. I approached him and said, I know you're a lithographer. You're an artist in residence. Would you consider doing this chapter in the book and doing 14 lithographs to coordinate with the songs on With the Beatles and tell the story of With the Beatles without me writing about it? And he said, I would love to. And he spent two years doing these lithographs. He's going to exhibit those, and he's going to exhibit the cover of Kid O'Toole's new book, which is his and was also picked up Mm -hmm. as the poster for the Grammy Beatles Symposium. And then I have to say my very favorite artist in the whole world is my husband, Rand Kessler, who never gets any attention at any of the fests or anything because he's always being so wonderful and helping me. But he is a an extremely talented pen and ink artist. He was chosen as the Carolyn Dorman Artist of the Year several years ago and exhibited 36 original pieces at the largest art gallery in Louisiana. He's created four multimedia sculptures of the Beatles, finding unusual things like the one called Our John actually has a John, a toilet seat in it, a la the toilet seat that John wore around his neck in Hamburg. It has an old antique keyboard coming up from that toilet seat to frame the neck of the guitar. And then the... um tuning pieces on the guitar are made with stars and the wires are are real old antique guitar strings. Each one of these is an amazing work of art. He's done one for each of the Beatles and he's going to exhibit that. And then Ken Orth is going to round off our host of artists. He's our third artist. He's going to show his unbelievable 3,800 piece collection, Meet the Lookalikes. It's a tribute to the Beatles. All of the album covers through the years that have paid homage to the Beatles or satirized the Beatles or or copied the Beatles. And he's going to exhibit that in the lobby of the Grammy. So, I mean, what a weekend. It's crazy. And you know how much we're charging? How much? $35. Wow. When when is it, Jude? April 1st and 2nd. Uh, Ivor and I will speak on April 1st in the evening. We will kick things off. I'm going to do Lennon's Liverpool and take people back to Liverpool of the 1950s and show how the Beatles came together. I have some beautiful, rare, rare, rare photographs. They're going to tell the story of those boys and how they came together. And then Ivor Davis will speak immediately after that about his time with the Beatles. That's Friday night. 
Saturday, it will be Candy, followed by Kid O'Toole, followed by Lena Stagg, Anthony Robustelli, good old Frida, and then Bruce will close with his uh, finale, The Beatles Are Coming, and then we have a live band, The Lonely Peppers, coming in to perform that night. So it's just going to be a really fun and special weekend. And how do people uh, sign up for this? If you'll go to GrammyMuseums.org, GrammyMuseums.org, and click on that, you'll see a picture of Ivor and myself. It'll say Beatles Symposium. Just click on that, and the ticket ticket sales are there. The schedule of events is there. And we're going to do a couple of really fun things, and anyone who wants to can come to it. We're going to Delta Blues Juke Joints. Uh, Alan, it's too bad you aren't coming. You need to come to this because you would mm. love it. We are going yeah, really? to the cross- yeah. I mean, we're going to the crossroads. We're going out to Poor Monkeys, where Delta Blues began on Thursday night, and to Dockery Farms on Friday. And we're going to get a tour of those places. And you know, we're going back to the roots, the the thing that really inspired the Beatles, their love yeah. of mm-hmm. blues. And we're going to get to go into those places and tour them. So. Come on down. Yeah, see, and- I was going to try and lure you up to uh, Portland with this whole show, but I can't offer you yeah. those juke joints, unfortunately. But <laughs> <laughs> I, bet you, I bet you have some good places, though. <laughs> mm, not that are that Beatles related, but you mm. never know. <laughs> uh, I was in Maine about 15 years ago and absolutely loved every single moment of it, so I can be lured very easily. Oh, okay. <laughs> Maine I'll has, try to find something in Connecticut for you. Maine has great laughter. Uh, I, I know that for a fact. So. Yeah, and Connecticut, yeah. My, <laughs> Connecticut is my husband's home state, and there is no place more beautiful than Con- Connecticut, Maine. It's just breathtaking. Pennsylvania, I lived in Pennsylvania for six years, right. and Al, you are a lucky man. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a change, but it's, uh, but it's a nice change. Yeah, it, I know. I know you're so very happy, and I'm so very happy for you. Jude, let me ask about your books. How can people get your books? JohnLennonSeries.com, mm-hmm. and it is that's the best price. Now, you can go on Amazon.com. They're more expensive on Amazon.com, and you can always get them on TheFest.com. Whichever way you go, I always write to you and ask you if you want me to sign it and do an inscription. So I communicate with everyone, whatever route you go, and I will be more than happy to sign one for you at the Fest for Beatles fans, April the 15th through the 17th. Can't wait to get to Westchester and and do three presentations there and hang out with the people I so love. Or you can come to the Grammy Museum Mississippi Symposium April 1st and 2nd. Okay. All right. So April's pretty busy for you. Yeah. It's crazy, yeah. and on top of all that, I'm renovating two bathrooms. Am I nuts or what? <laughs> you are. Oh, my God. <laughs> well, when, does the, when does the next book come out, Jude? 2017, God willing, and the creeks don't rise. I have. Um, <laughs> most of you know that my mom passed about uh, two years ago, two years ago this week, mm-hmm. as a matter of fact. And so I've been caring for my dad, who is going to be 96 in about a month. And so that has required much more time than I ever thought that it would. It's a joy, and I know that I'm blessed to have my dad here with me. But this book progress has been slow. I have not been able to devote the time to it that I did the others. So I'm saying 2017, but but if I don't make it and it runs over into 2018, you know I'm doing the best I can. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. And you'll, you'll definitely see Al and myself. At the Fest for Beatles fans. Yes. Up. I can't right. wait. As well as some of the same people that will be at the Beatles Symposium, like yeah. Kid O'Toole. You know? Right, right. I think Ivor's there too, isn't he? And, he is. Uh, and, and, well, Ivor, and won't be at, well, Ivor won't be at the Fest, but, he, oh. but Anthony Robostelli will. Obviously, Bruce, because he's kind of, uh, he kind of comes with the furniture now. Right. And, <laughs> uh, you no, know, and, and 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 Kit will be there the first time that Kit's done a, a New York area fest. Yeah, and I always love having her there. We do our little debate called Kit and Caboodle, and this time we're going to attack Revolver, and I'm going to stand for the John songs on Revolver as being the best, and she's going to stand for the Paul songs on Revolver as being the best. And so help me, Robert Rodriguez. If it weren't for Robert, I'm afraid that I would have to just call surrender to Kit, but. 
Robert's wonderful book, Revolver, How the Beatles Reimagined Rock and Roll, will get me through. <laughs> That's true. That, 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 despite, that, that debate is despite the fact that George Harrison has three songs on Revolver. Yeah, That's yeah, not, more than more than on anything else. Very well true. Right. White Album, I guess. That's yeah. right. Maybe you should do yep. George and jump in there with us. <laughs> <laughs> it might happen. Yep. Ooh, yeah. there we there we go. There we go. Um, it's a it's a great debate discussing you know what right. was the Beatles' best album or what was their peak, and certainly because of Robert's book, it's it's made people. It's one of the reasons why I think people are appreciating Revolver more and more now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it really, I did absolutely did not like Revolver. I remember taking it off of the record player and looking at my friend Emily Moss and saying, what in the world has happened to the Beatles? <laughs> and, yeah. you know, I was just, you know, I almost was in tears and thinking, there's nothing I can like on this LP except for maybe for no one. I don't really like this. And now, after reading his book, I completely appreciate it. It may not be my favorite Live at the BBC Part 1 and Part 2 LP, (laughs) but I do see the genius in it. It is a great book. Okay, The BBC stuff is your favorite? My absolute favorite. I love those early days. If I could go in a time machine back to the Cavern Club I promise I would not do anything to violate time ethics. I wouldn't try to talk to John or tell him about his future, but I would love to just stand there and see it. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. Oh, cool. Well, guys, we are past the hour mark, and we are, you know, about uh, about due to to call it quits. Jude, this has been great. Um, Yeah, absolutely. This has been absolutely fantastic. We will have to have you back again um, in the future to talk about uh, something else John related or when the, when the uh, next book comes out, but maybe uh, hopefully before that, we would love to have you back here again. Well, it's a great honor. I really have looked forward to this. I can't tell you how much, and I appreciate you guys giving me a chance to tell you not only about the book, but just to talk about John. And yeah, that's my passion. That's why I'm here. This series is going to take me 43 years to complete. So it's my life's work and being able to share that with people who really understand means the world to me. So thank you so very much. Oh, you're, you're more than welcome. Absolutely. You're more than welcome. Really, wa- really wonderful having you. Yes, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. To everyone out there, if you want to uh, comment on the show or uh, um, we'd love to hear from you, um, please send your letters to things we said today radio show at gmail.com or you can tweet us uh on uh, things we said uh, fab with the little uh at sign there um let me go around uh, Al- uh alan let me start with you if you got anything you want to let people know about uh, uh, no not really <laughs> that's well di- ditto ditto what alan was saying nothing nothing in uh, in particular and ken Always check my website for Beatles Triv every single week for your chance to win one of nine prizes. And I might have something very soon promoting uh, Jude's book, possibly the Beatles Symposium at the Grammy Museum. Okay. Ah. Okay. Has anybody uh, – uh, let's see. Um, uh, let's go around and, uh, and uh, give uh, everybody – uh, your email addresses. Uh, if you want to get a hold of me, it's BeatlesExaminer at gmail dot com, or you can catch me on my uh, Examiner pages or on Facebook under my name, and also in the Beatles News and Commentary group. Uh, uh, Alan, I'm going to run over to you next. Okay, just uh, on Facebook, Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed, and uh, that's the easiest way to get me. And uh, Mr. Sussman? Uh, on Facebook uh, at Al Sussman or on Twitter at A-S-U-S-S-4-9 uh, or at www.beetlefan.com for Beetle Fan Magazine and www.paradingpress.com for Changing Times, 101 Days to Shape the Generation. And Ken? Uh, on Facebook under Ken Michaels, since there are many Ken Michaels out there, <laughs> I'm the... I'm the, I'm the I'm I'm the guy that you will see with my wife and son posing with Todd Rundgren. That's how you'll know us. And um, you can email me 
at everylittlething at att.net, and again, my website, kenmichaelsradio.com. Until somebody else, until another Ken Michaels poses with Todd Rundgren, you're all set. <laughs> <laughs> Jude, how can people get a hold of you? On Twitter, it's at Jude Kessler, uh, all small, and my email is rjkess, K-E-S-S, at comcast.net. Okay. All right. Um, anything else, Jude, going on with you that we that you want to let people know about? I just hope to see them all at the Fest for Beatles fans. We will all congregate, and the weather mm-hmm. this year is going to be great. No snow. We're <laughs> doing it a little bit later, so it's going to be beautiful. We'll look forward to rocking and rolling with you there. I'm going to do the Foils Literary Luncheon program with 98 rare photographs on the main stage on Saturday morning. So come join me for that. I think it's 11 o'clock, right, Al? I believe so, yeah. Okay. And they come to the Grammy, and we will party mm-hmm. in Cleveland, Mississippi, April 1st yeah. and 2nd. Okay. All right. Jude, thank you. Thank you again very much for, for being here. We, we loved having you. And you. this is Steve Marinucci for Ken Michaels, Al Sussman, and Alan Cozen saying thank you once again for listening to Things We Said Today, and we will see you next time. Mm-hmm.